Welcome everyone to today's ISTAT Learning Lab. Today we'll be discussing the legal aspects of various options available for financing aircraft portfolio transactions and their key features. My name is Jen Zhu. I'm based in Singapore with Alton Aviation Consultancy. The two speakers who are joining us today are Marie O'Brien and Keith Mohan from ANL Good Body. Ms. Marie O'Brien is a partner in ANL Good Body and the head of the finance department. She is also the head of aviation and transport finance. Marie is highly experienced in advising in relation to the acquisition, leasing, financing, and trading of a variety of asset classes, including aircraft, engines, helicopters, ship, rail, machinery, and equipment. Mr. Keith Mohan is a partner and a key member of the aviation and transport finance practice of NL Good Body. He has acted for a wide range of aviation clients, including leasing companies, airlines, banks, manufacturers, funds, and the credit support providers. He has extensive experience acting on a variety of aviation financing and leasing products and structures, including operating leases, finance leases, sell leasebacks, draw call structures, and other financing structures. The format of today's session is that Marie and Keith will jointly present their views for about 60 to 75 minutes, and then we will open up for an audience Q&A session. So we would like to encourage the audience to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to send in any questions you might have as we go along this session. Now let's welcome Marie and Keith to start their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, and thank you to ISTAT for giving us uh, the opportunity to um, contribute uh, to this. I'm just going to upload my slides. Um, hopefully that works. Um, um, hopefully people can see my slides. Um, just yeah, want to say that uh, we're very grateful to ISA for the opportunity to contribute uh, to the, the Learning Lab series. I think it's an incredibly important series and very valuable um, for us to be able to, as an as a aviation community, to, to share knowledge and particularly for uh, new talent um, and up and coming talent in the industry to have access to this insight to so many aspects of, of the industry. The, um, the Learning Lab series uh, now provides an absolute uh, treasure trove of, of um, information for anybody who wants to understand this industry better. And I think that that makes us all stronger. So just want to, to say thank you for that. Um, I am honored to be joined by my colleague, uh, Keith Mulhern, uh, fellow aviation finance partner. Uh, myself and Keith have been working together for, for many years. He's very highly regarded uh, within our aviation finance group and, and in the broader industry. And Keith is uh, highly experienced, as Jen said, on these structures. So uh, we'll be able to share um, his, his experience on these structures and give you an overview of them. Um, I, I don't think anyone will disagree with me with saying that it is expected and anticipated that a feature of the year to come, and, and I think a number of years to come uh, for this industry will be the financing of aircraft portfolios. And it has been a hot topic in terms of our discussions, uh, both in January in Dublin at the conference, uh, but also since, um, and the shape of how that financing uh, will take place and what are the factors that will feed into it. So. Um, we thought it was an interesting topic and one that might uh, th that might uh, be useful for for everybody. Um, the the large number of aircraft deliveries that are scheduled, the fact that uh, new platforms are seeking to uh, to build up their portfolios, existing platforms are potentially seeking to uh, restructure or organize their their portfolios. And um, aircraft need to be uh, renewed, need to be financed. And, and that will drive a lot of activity. Um, what happens is that this will happen in a variety of different forms. There's no perfect uh, form of financing. Every form has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, and actually what you'll find is that many, um, many industry players will want to have a, a diversification and a variety in terms of how they approach 
uh, their financing needs. So, so that will drive um, them to look at different types. Uh, so, um, Marie, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, it looks like we're having that same kind of thing again. It looks like it, your screen share is loading. Okay, just one second. Let me see. Is that better? Looks perfect. Okay. Well, I have to say I'm delighted with my technical ability to fix that. So uh, that's great. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Ben, for, for that. I'm glad I want people to be able to see this properly. Um, look, uh, um, in, in, in terms of what we hope to cover today, it won't be possible to get through every uh, type of, of structure or indeed uh, to, to go into each structure uh, too in depth. And many of you may be grateful for that fact. But what I do hope is that you come away with a, with a greater understanding with regard to uh, what the options are, what might drive the particular options. And as Jen said, please do ask your questions. Uh, we're very happy to, to give any further clarification or interest um, or deal with any kind of questions of interest that you may have. So uh, in terms of stepping back um, a little bit um, to just for, for those who are, are less um, uh, familiar with this, if, if you go back to the, the 1970s, airlines generally owned uh, their aircraft and uh, you know the financing was done on the basis of the, the, the credit worthiness of the airline. Um, as uh, we got in the late 70s and, and 80s, as uh, aircraft lessors started entering the market, it completely revolutionized this aspect of how aircraft could be financed and, and, and how the, the whole industry could be structured and what it opened up in terms of availability of new aircraft and availability of different options around this uh, so that you could move into a form of asset finance whereby what you were looking at was not just the credit worthiness of the borrower, which is you know, always relevant, but actually what you're looking at is the value of the asset and you could develop into uh, structures allowing and um, you know, non-recourse financing, et cetera. Sorry, I am just trying to uh, move my slides. Yes, perfect view. Um, so, um, so what we have done here is, is just set out a, just a very um, basic list um, in terms of the types of financing structures that we hope uh, to chat through with you today. So, um, So one of the first things when, when either an airline or a lessor is looking to acquire their aircraft, um, one of the questions they will ask is, you know, will this be on a secured or an unsecured basis? Uh, many won't have a choice about whether it's on a secured or unsecured basis because uh, the unsecured market is very much driven by the, the credit worthiness. Uh, so you're talking about investment grade uh, lessors, you're talking about credit worthy airlines who have the availability to use this type of uh, unsecured financing, which can fall into two different options, be it um, at issuance of bonds uh, in, in the markets or um, a bank debt that is unsecured, revolving uh, usually bank debt or terminal bank debt that is uh, unsecured. And um, that provides a very efficient and flexible option um, and you will see that used and, and those who have access to the unsecured market uh, will tap into that market um, regularly where they can. Um, and it has generally held up uh, strongly. What I will say, as I mentioned, is just because you have access to the unsecured market doesn't necessarily mean that you won't explore um, other options because the need to, to uh, spread your, your lending structures to, to have a bit of diversification around that means that uh, there's often a mix in terms of what people uh, will look at. But um, the, the unsecured market is certainly uh, one that is, is very attractive, but uh, as I said, potentially not, um, not open to everybody. Um, a, a, an option that, um, that people, before I move on to kind of then the secured financing and the various different structures, just to, I suppose, stop and, and flag that obviously leasing of itself, as I mentioned, when it was introduced, leasing of itself is a, is a, a financing option and it gave uh, airlines an ability to have more flexibility with regard to their fleet. They could take uh, aircraft on an operating or finance lease basis. Um, and even lessors themselves, if they needed, uh, had an opportunity to participate in, in, in uh, leases. And the, the types of leasing uh, became quite diversified and you have 
options um, in the Japanese market around JALs and JALCOs uh, involving Japanese investors that gave, uh, you know, gave great, um, uh, great advantage um, into the market and allowed people to move aircraft and access aircraft where they mightn't have been able to on their own balance sheet. Um, the sale and leaseback market has been incredibly uh, busy and I think will continue to be busy. And that's one just to explain um, whereby uh, potentially uh, uh, somebody has an uh, order book in, for example, or they own a, a portfolio of aircraft. But in order to um, give themselves some uh, leeway with regard to capital or some flexibility, they may sell uh, the rights to acquire those aircraft uh, to, uh, to a buyer. Uh, who will lease the aircraft back uh, to that entity. So they don't lose the opportunity for access to the aircraft in question, but what it does do is remove the, um, the pressure with regard to coming up to capital in, in funding all those aircraft. So uh, just to bear in mind that the leasing aspect in itself is a financing option, but the way we will discuss it today is that it actually flows more into uh, kind of a combination with the other uh, structured and types of financing that we see uh, on a daily basis because leases would form uh, a huge part of uh, of these structures as well. Um, the secured uh, lending, uh, this is you know, a very broad uh, reference to a wide range of different types of, of financing that can be um, engaged in on a secured basis. So this is one where, yes, the credit worthiness of the borrower is very important, but you are also um, oftentimes uh, able to look at the, the, the value of the asset. And uh, by putting security in a mortgage on the asset, it means that the lenders get additional protection here. Um, there's a couple of common themes, and one of them would be around the fact that you would still need to put up equity um, in terms of or, or subordinated debt, but essentially equity in terms of the financing of the aircraft, because you won't get 100% uh, financing for it. Um, it. We do see it approached in, in lots of different ways. You can have one lender, you can have syndicated lenders, you can have tranched lenders, which means you'll have senior and junior lenders. Um, and the opportunity in terms of the flexibility around these structures will really depend on both the relationship between the, the lenders and, and the borrower um, as they build up trust and confidence in working with each other. Uh, but there are a number of different features that you can put in uh, around the security package um, and around uh, the structure, be it the covenants, be it the representations, uh, to, to make sure that um, uh, both parties are, are comfortable, but that from the lender's perspective, that they are able to gauge the risk of this transaction uh, fairly uh, sometimes you will uh, see this, you know, secured lending being referred to or analogous to, you know, buying a house where you have a mortgage given over the house. But what I would say is, you know, the, the, the nuance here is that house gets up and flies around the world. So uh, that's a little bit different. And what that means is the multi-jurisdictional aspect uh, that you need to be aware of and understand in terms of the rights, uh, protections, risks for your asset that you have just financed that is incredibly valuable and your asset that you've owned and owe a lot of money on uh, moves around the world and you need to make sure that you're conscious of what the consequences of that are and how that impacts on the, the security package that is given. So what you will generally find, particularly as, as the topic that we're talking about is a portfolio of aircraft. So what you will particularly find is that there will be a, a large number of different jurisdictions involved, it be the jurisdiction of the borrower, the lender, and then where all the, the airlines are associated in the portfolio. Because when you're looking at a portfolio financing, the lenders will be uh, conscious to um, allocate uh, risk across that portfolio. So they will uh, want to, to not have all their risk um, concentrated maybe in one airline, potentially, um, or in one jurisdiction. Um, on the flip side, when you have the portfolio um, of aircraft, it does allow you to put in features such as cross collateralization and cross default. So cross collateralization would mean that the security will apply you know, across the whole portfolio in terms of the financing that's, that's been put in place. And that will give a little bit of extra uh, protection for the lenders. Um, I've mentioned here an orphan structure, an orphan borrower. I might not go into this and uh, I, because I think this might pop up in some of what uh, Keith may, um, may specify, but just so in case for anyone new, newer to this, just a flag that that is an option. It's not 
this secured lending doesn't necessarily have to be done and can often be done through group structures and subsidiaries, but there is other uh, features that can be added on and the orphan structure is one of those that can be added on uh, to create a little bit more remoteness between the borrower and the lender. Um, and the idea behind that is to uh, protect the value of the assets and also protect against um, insolvency risk if something goes wrong, I'm conscious of time. Um, so uh, there, there are some of the, the basic aspects. Um, with the secure lending, you will have a full uh, security package um, and Keith will talk a little bit about that security package. I don't want to duplicate across that because the security package in terms of the mortgage and other elements will be relevant in a number of different types of uh, financing structures that we will, will come across. Um, what, I, what I will say is certain of the, the, the structuring elements of this and, and you know, thankfully, we've been involved because Ireland remains such a hub for aircraft financing. A lot of these structures end up flowing through Irish companies. And um, so we've been uh, privileged to have um, access and insight across uh, a lot of these uh, different financing structures. And it's and it, the structuring bit at the start, I think, is, is really important to understand what flexibility the borrower and the lender needs, how the drawdowns will be uh, will be structured and and how how the security package will work in the context of the operation of the, the fleet and the aircraft and also understanding the, the business plan for the borrower in terms of uh, movement of, of aircraft, be it releasing or um, or swapping in uh, aircraft to replace ones that are, are, are being sold. So actually understanding that at the start is vital in terms of how the structure is put together, because um, although they have a lot of common features in terms of there'll be security, uh, there will be separation to a certain extent and, and kind of key covenants and key protections for the lender. Actually, there is, uh, there is quite a, a lot of optionality in terms of what, what way you want to structure it in order to give you, um, to, to give you the flexibility you need um, such that it doesn't end up being expensive to kind of unpick this each time that you want to change uh, something about the structure. So I'll try, um, not veer too much into what Keith is going to talk about. What I might do is, is pass over to Keith uh, to, to chat on to some of the next elements. Um, and, and I will come back to at the end um, in terms of a few other um, options that are there. And hopefully uh, we will have given you enough information to fuel a few questions. But Keith, I'm, I'm going to try and, and be good in terms of my timing. So I will pass over to you um, and hopefully I'll manage the slides well. Um, just before I do this, yeah, this this uh, is one of the structure charts just explaining uh, the secured lending. But uh, we can we pick through this as we go through the various different uh, structures. So I think this will be uh, very familiar to you by the end. Thanks, Murray. Um, just to echo Murray's sentiments at the start, I'm obviously delighted to be here. I think um, the learning labs, uh, ISTAT's efforts around it have been fantastic for the industry and a fantastic source of knowledge. And the repository of knowledge they've built up is, is, is really a great resource for young talent coming through. So I'm delighted to contribute to that. Um, I would say what Marie has done is set a very good framework and set out some of the general principles that apply right across the board through all the various structures that we're going to go through. Just one thing to say is, with that framework in mind, just bear in mind that we're only going to touch on each of these because some of these topics would probably justify a lecture in their own right. Um, but happy to delve deeper in, into any points to the extent there are questions, you know, either through the lecture or at the end. And um, that slide that Marie has up around secured loan sample structures, that, that is um, a good one to keep in your mind because the different structures, particularly the Irish structures that we go through today, are all to an extent, certain variations on that core idea of a borrower, you know, under a financing um, either buying and financing and leasing air, aircraft directly to a lessee or an airline or owning shares in, 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 an, in a special purpose vehicle that, that that's business has been set up solely for owning and leasing that aircraft, the external debt coming into the borrower. Um, and, and, and as Marie said, you know, you'll have external debt and equity funding as well, making up the difference in the purchase price. So the things we'll go through just for the rest of the lecture are all variations on, on, on that type of structure. So it's a good one to keep in mind. And um, if you could just go on to the next slide, Marie. 
Um, so one of, the, one, one of the key points Marie made there was about the difference between one-off or single aircraft financings or, or a small number of aircraft financings and portfolio financings and some of the, the different challenges that can throw up. The warehouse financing um, is an example of, of, of an often used portfolio financing. And it's, it's, it's typically sometimes called a bridging or short, short, ter short term financing that, that um, airlines or lessors utilize while they're assessing longer term options to finance their assets. Um, one of the common strategies over the last number of years was to use a warehouse while a lessor builds up a portfolio um, over a period of time with a view to flipping that into a capital markets financing product such as an ABS. And we would have spent a number of years working on those types of transactions. Um, I think at the moment they're, they're quite relevant in the sense that because debt is more expensive than it was this time last year and, and with inflationary pressures um, requiring central banks to push up interest rates and accordingly raise the cost of debts with a certain lag behind for for, for aircraft lease rates um, th that has put pressure on, 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 on market players in terms of finding financing solutions. And one thing we're seeing is the warehouse it looked at, you know, in terms of um, lessors who have warehouses in terms of extending them or amending them or adapting them to find um, short-term or interim solutions until markets stabilize. Um, you know, it, it, they, they can be fixed term um, or revolving. So if they're revolving, you can draw funds, repay them and draw them again over a certain amount of time. They tend to have longer commitment periods, availability periods to draw down the loans. And um, they tend to finance, as I said, portfolios of multiple aircraft over time. So you might have a financial close where you put the warehouse structure in place. And then for an available commitment period, of, you will draw down on an aircraft by aircraft or basis. Um, as Marie said, you have your debt and equity portions. So generally speaking, the bank will fund in around 80, 85% of, of, of the, the purchase price of the aircraft, the cost of the aircraft. Um, and it is a secured loan, um, generally speaking. Um, the rest of the purchase price has to come in the form of equity through you know, intercompany funding, coordinated loans, or, or sometimes um, subscriptions for shared capital or, or capital contributions. Um, the considerations Marie identified in terms of concentration risk and cross collateralization, cross default provisions, that all applies here. It's lenders be very concerned because it is asset based financing and their recourse is generally speaking, credit analysis built around recourse to the asset. It's very important to the lenders that. It's not con the the aircraft portfolio isn't concentrated too much in a particular risky area, such as a particular airline or a particular region or a particular jurisdiction, and risk to go with that. So concentration um, ratios are 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 heavily negotiated. Um, it's secured financing, so you can have different types of security. Generally across the board, you'll see security given over the aircraft itself. Um, often under New York or English law, um, and then depending on the jurisdiction in which the aircraft is operated or which the borrower is based, you might have um, local law aircraft security granted as well. Um, you often have a security assignment over the rights related to the aircraft. So importantly, rental flows under the lease, you take a security assignment then such that if there's a default and enforcement scenario arises, the lender can stay, step in and, and, and take the benefit of those rights. We can receive the rentals directly without going to the borrower. Um, you can take um, the also assignments in respect of insurance proceeds, requisition compensation if there was a seizure of the aircraft by a public authority, things like that. The, the others is if, if the rents are paid into a bank account, um, you might take account of security. Um, and finally, you might also take um, security over the shares of the borrower. So I mentioned these, these structures are often done through special purpose vehicles that are set up solely for the purpose of leasing the aircraft. Um, so you, you might take security over the shares. And the advantage of that is that rather than taking title to the aircraft and potentially disrupting the leases 
um, the lease arrangements while you have a performing, potentially performing lessee, um, but maybe not. You can you can take the shares of the company and minimize the disruption to the lease arrangements. That that's the idea in theory. You know, it doesn't necessarily work out like that in all the time in practice. Um, the, the the corollary of that is because it's a revolving facility and aircraft may move in and out of the warehouse. You need to ensure that the, the warehouse provisions allow you to release those aircraft on paying down the individual loans. So you'll have aircraft flowing in and out. The security is granted and released as those aircraft flow in and out. Um, you, you often have um, a borrower set up who draws the funds under the warehouse. And then, as I mentioned earlier, that borrower might own or be affiliated with the SPVs. Um, so you might have limits on the number of aircraft that can go into a particular SPV. You know, typically, you know, one to four aircraft. You, you wouldn't often see um, different lessees within the one company. Um, just from, in terms of risk analysis, um, and it, it, it's important just in the structuring that if you have that borrower and then SPV level, you need to make sure that the warehouse funds drawn into the borrower get pushed down through either other intercompany debt or, 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 or mechanisms. Um, in terms of moving aircraft in and out of the warehouse structure, and this is again another common theme for portfolio financings, there's different ways to do that. You can move the metal, um, which is a transfer of title in the aircraft by a sale and purchase agreement or otherwise, um, along with if the aircraft's on lease, innovation or, or, or a lease assignment in favor of, of the buyer. Um, or similar to the share charge analysis, you can have transfer of the shares in a company under or next to the borrower in the structure. Um, and that has just slightly different considerations that can preserve the lease arrangements or be less disruptive to the lease arrangements. But obviously your warehouse borrower then takes on, you know, the history and liabilities of that company. So it's important to lenders that these SPVs are clean. Um, and also there's different transfer tax considerations depending on whether you're moving an aircraft or, or, or a company. Um, the other potential option that's become popular in recent years is to, is to use an aircraft owner trust, which is effectively a, a structure where you have a trustee, a professional service provider takes title to the aircraft, holds it for the benefit of, of, of a lessor entity, and then you move the beneficial interest, but the, the title arrangements and the trust stay in place. So some of you might just you know, refer to beneficial interest transfers or, or trust transfers. Um, just in terms of, the, of the, the, the warehouse documents that are up on screen at the moment, it, 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 and we do list documents throughout the lecture, but it's important to note it's, it's really more the principles that are important. You might see different variations of documents depending on the jurisdictions involved or the parties involved. But you will have typically a warehouse loan agreement um, attached to that warehouse loan agreement. You will have intercreditor terms in something like a proceeds deed or an intercreditor deed that might be in the warehouse loan itself. It might be in a separate document. It might be in the security agreement. Then you'll have the security agreement generally. So it generally looks like a master security agreement and then you have agreed form supplements or agreed form documents, security documents issued under that. So with the warehouse, the advantages is in terms of efficiency, you're not reinventing the wheel every time you fund an aircraft. You it's supposed to be more efficient and cost saving for the parties involved than you know, um, bilateral financing this aircraft by aircraft. The subordinated loan we mentioned in terms of the equity funding, I've mentioned the security supplement, I've gone through the security documents already. So that, that's, that's all I'll say about warehouses for the moment. We'll move on to the next structure. Um, it, ABS in particular has, has um, had an enormous amount of commentary in the last year, and I, I won't attempt to do it any great justice other than refer to some of the learning labs that have preceded this lecture and and just say that there's been some fantastic resources already on the ice that learning labs for that. Um, as, as a lot of you will know, perhaps some of you don't, you know, as the fact securities are, they fall into that secured bucket that Marie mentioned, and they're a secured financing product um, utilizing the capital market. So Marie talked about unsecured financing where certain lessors, investment grade lessors can issue unsecured bonds and that has been a very popular method of, of raising finance for the last number of years. It's a much smaller pool of financing activity, but 
but a very important one for the market in terms of facilitating trading activity is, is the asset-backed security, which is um, in a particular important source of funding for those just outside that IG rating or just those mid-size as always things. Um, so they're, they're bonds backed by financial assets being, being aircraft in, in simple terms. What we're talking about here is selling a product to note um, in the capital markets to institutional investors that is, that is backed by the aircraft, but also the cash flows associated with the aircraft, so the rents. The aircraft are encumbered or on these two airlines. The rents flow up into the into the ABS issuer, and then those rents are used to pay down the notes. Um, the investor value on the investor side is delivered through portfolio diversification. So you have a portfolio of aircraft to different airlines with different credits, with different risk analysis, with different concentrations in the portfolio. Um, so that diversification um, is, is, is attractive, and um, obviously. The, the, the strength of the credits and cash flows from the airlines are, are extremely important as well as the underlying value of the assets themselves. The notes tend to be tranche, so you, based on risk, so you can have first A's, B's, C's, so on and so forth, and then with your equity return, often your sponsored vehicle will be, you know, um, holding E-notes. So obviously the, the, the A notes tend to have priority in terms of the tranching, they get paid first and Bs and Cs. But the risk analysis is the, you know, the interest is lower for the A's because it's less risky. And then as the risk increases of, of default or non-payment, the interest rate increases as well. So it's, it's they're tranched notes. It's it's a product that's been around for quite some time, um, before my time, certainly stretching back to the 90s. Um, but it has evolved quite a bit over, over several years, um, going through different phases in the 90s to, to 9-11, and then post 9-11 until, until the, the recession in 2008. Um, and we've seen different structural enhancements over the years. The, the latest um, version of the ABS or, 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 or popularity of the ABS came post um, credit crunch recession, uh, it, probably around 2013, 2014, where we started seeing more, more more issues in the market and then peaking in 2019 before um before before the, the, the impact of COVID. Um maybe just go on to the next slide. Mary. Um this is a very generic idea of what the structure looks like. There they can be much more complicated than this uh, and some parts may not be relevant. But the idea is effectively that you have an issuer um set up typically um in 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 Bermuda or the Cayman Islands, but tax resident in Ireland, um, or you back going back a number of years, you might have had Irish issuers, Irish incorporated issuers, um, and there's usually usually a US issuer as well, um, and that's just to, to segregate streams of US derived and non US derived income. Um, the issuer issues notes um, to 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 a note holder, effectively a, a bank that arranges the the the, the product on behalf of investors. Um, those investors invest under the notes and fund the issuer and acquire a portfolio of aircraft from certain sellers um, who tend to be affiliates, not always of um, the sponsor, the lessor involved in the structure. Um, the issuer, um, Marie mentioned orphan trusts. The issuer is often held in an orphan trust. And the reason we do that with like it too bogged down in it is for bankruptcy remoteness. And the idea is that um, the structure is meant to stand on its own two feet without, with minimal um, contagion risk from the lessor who's sponsoring it. So if, um, you know, a lessor were to sponsor an ABS and service that ABS, um, there would be a concern that if that lessor were to go into a bankruptcy procedure or proceeding in different jurisdictions, whether it be the US, Ireland or elsewhere, there's a concern that those bankruptcy laws could pull the ABS vehicle into it and therefore make create risks that the assets in the ABS may be used to pay down external debts of the lessor to the detriment of the note holders. So we spend a lot of time going through non-consolidation risks and there are typically non-consolidation opinions given around, around that consolidation risk and we build structural enhancements into the structure such as limited recourse that, that Marie mentioned, um, putting independent non-executive directors on the board 
um, to represent the interests of the note holder as distinct from the, the sponsor, the lessor, other board structure and mechanics, whether they're majority independent, majority equity appointed, um, and, 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 and also we put like separatist covenants and things like that there. Basically, to, to create a structure, a robust structure, whereby the, the issuer vehicle and the aircraft in it are operated almost as their own self-contained business. Of course, there's still technical expertise um, needed to manage the portfolio, and that's where the servicing arrangement, these management arrangements come in from the servicer, which is extremely important and, and an essential part of the credit analysis around the ABS in terms of giving the investors comfort that the portfolio will be managed correctly and dealt with correctly and to, to give the investors comfort that their, their investment is being protected. Um, so, so within the, the issuer, then we have um, aircraft owners effectively sitting under it. Um, so the issuer will either incorporate the aircraft owners who will acquire the aircraft by metal transfer, similar to a warehouse, or it, if, if we take the common strategy of flipping a portfolio from a warehouse into an ABS, it might buy the shares in these aircraft owning companies. Um, or if we have an aircraft in a trust, we might have a beneficial interest transfer of of that, that of that trusted aircraft in, into a company within the issuer group. Um, you have certain other, other professional bodies involved. The managing agent is typically appointed to deal with the, the with the various financing points and structural points around managing the, um, the, the 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 companies, and a liquidity facility is typically put in place to cover interest payments um, for up to nine months. Um, uh, look, I think um, if you could maybe move on to the next one. Um, finishing on ABS, we could probably go go on with that all day, but we move on for the sake of timing. Um, pre delivery payments are another um, relatively bespoke form of financing. So, a lot of you on the call will probably know that um, aircraft are expensive, um, and when you buy aircraft, particularly new aircraft from Boeing or Airbus or, or any other manufacturer, you have to make, you often have to make staged payments or progress or installment payments as the aircraft's being built. Um, we call those pre-delivery payments and they be, they can be quite a sizable outlay. Um, it varies, you know, you can get up to 30% of, of, of the actual price of the aircraft being required to pay through PDPs, which is then credited at the end against the purchase price. So a, a financing product has developed around that, a secured financing product has developed around that. Basically what happens is um, your airline purchaser who has the order book with, 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 with the manufacturer takes a secured loan, pays interest on that secured loan, um, and then periodically, and then when the aircraft is delivered off, off, off either the manufacturer, the loan is repaid, and that loan is used to basically fund the, the PDP payments. PDPs are, PDP financing is different to typical aircraft financing in that, you know, what myself and Marie have been talking about up until now is it's, re, it's, it's, it's asset-based financing. So your investors, your lenders, recourse to the asset, but with PDPs, there's no asset yet. So that poses, that, that poses its own type of challenges. So what your, what your lender is taking in terms of collateral is actually an assignment of the rights in and to the airline's purchase agreement. Um, and that throws up different challenges in terms of security analysis and enforcement rights and how things play out if things go wrong. Um, with that security assignment, um, basically what that gives is the lender a right, should a default happen, it can step in and acquire all the, the, the airline's rights on the purchase agreement. And then there might be a tripartite agreement whereby the manufacturer and the lender agree just how that step in process is going to work and who takes what risk. Um, it, it, it can present um, a number of challenges, um, not least of which is uncertainty around pricing and pricing methodologies, because I'm sure a number of you will know that aircraft are bought in rather large order books, heavily negotiated terms around pricing. Um, typically with escalation clauses and caps and so on and so forth. So lenders may not have visibility on how that's been negotiated and what the actual price of the aircraft will be. There's also the issue that order books are placed quite a while in advance. So there's even uncertainty around what position the market will be when the aircraft's delivered and, and where values will be at, be at at that time. So there's a, an awful lot of effort um, 
put into how pricing works and how the lender determines how much it needs to lend and how much it needs to fund mm -hmm. in terms of uh, it, it's, its loan. The other thing is, you know, depending on uncertainties around the market, the lender's right on enforcement of security assignments to step in, but it may choose not to step in. It may be actually detrimental to it to step in, depending on what the, what the situation is. So the, the question becomes, um, you know, if, if the lender steps in, it takes on the purchase obligations and the values of the aircraft may, may be such that it's not worth its while to step in or it's better to try to find another solution. Um, so the lender's other option is to walk away or it might seek to negotiate with the manufacturer um, a contractual right to, 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 to basically recover some of the lender funded PDPs. Um, manufacturers will often have a purchase option over the aircraft itself um, that, it, that it is not obliged but may exercise. Um, and then I, I think the only other thing to say about PDPs is um, it's just a bit of analysis done around bankruptcy risk there as well. So we've talked about orphan SPVs. T typically, there are concerns around what would happen if your airline or your lessor, if it's, if it's a lessor uh, financing, if 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 it were to go into an insolvency and the laws of that insolvency jurisdiction allowed clawback of the PDPs paid, which would leave a shortfall with the manufacturer of the PDPs, and there's an argument as to who should bear the risk of that should 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 the manufacturer and um, notwithstanding this had to refund the PDPs and um, still apply what I perceive to to the purchase price and discount the lender if it needs to step in or would it would it not do so in which case the lender has funded the PDPs that have been refunded and it has to make that up with the purchase price and um, so there's a lot of concern around bankruptcy risk and PDP financings and for that reason you'd all often see an orphan um, borrower set up in order to fund the PDPs with, with external debt from the lender coming in and also equity funding coming into that, that orphan borrower. And then the usual PDP arrangements were in that. I go on to the next slide, Marie. Um, that's okay, yeah. Um, e e ECA financing. Um, just to note, ECAs are, tend to be state or quasi-state bodies set up with a, with a public mandate to promote um, and facilitate exports um, in, a, in a particular jurisdiction. Um, so the main players have been, you know, the Export Import Bank in the United States, um, or in Europe, we have UKIF, um, Euro Hermes, or BPI France, China, the Export Import Bank of China and Canada, um, EDC. Um, so their, their mandate and they, they became, as a source of financing, they became particularly important um, post 2008 when normal sources of capital dried up. And um, in, in fact, around you know, 2013, um, some statistics show that nearly a third of financings in the market in that year were done through ECA or ECA related financing structures. But as, as the market picked up and 2014, 2015, and we've seen more of a focus on, you know, capital markets and, and the ABS, we've seen that fall right back down to about four or 5% in, in 2017. So it, they've been a really important um, capital and financing source for the industry in times where other sources or typical sources of capital um, are less available. Um, they can operate in, and if you think back to the secured financing structure, Marie kind of put up towards the start of the lecture, this is just a variation on that where you have a similar structure, you have this ECA overlay on it. And, and, and what happens is, is effectively the ECA um, guarantees the, 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 the risk of a borrower default under the deal. So you'll have your typical structure, you know, the borrower will uh, buy an aircraft from the manufacturer, lease that aircraft to an airline, it will fund that aircraft with external debt and, and any balance left over a true equity. Um, and the difference is then you will also have a guarantee given by the, the export credit agency, um, which basically says that if your borrower doesn't pay, the, 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 the ECA will pay out of the guarantee. They can do it different ways. They can, they can support the financing through a guarantee or they can direct lend. Um, 
and it can be done in, 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 in terms of structuring, it can be done in different ways. You can have you know, direct support being given to an airline leasing transaction or an airline financing transaction, whereby um, the, the loan is given to an orphan borrower typically, which then finance leases that um, aircraft, which, which acquires the aircraft and finance leases it to the airline. Or you can have more of a, a, a lessor style transaction whereby you might have an orphan borrower which finance leases it to the, to the lessor SBV, which then in turn operate leases it to an airline. So you can have different, different variations in the structure. Um, I, I think just in terms of the documents, you know, we've gone through the usual security suite. I think that what I described before will still apply here. Um, and then if we just move on to the, the last one, Marie. And then just a, just a quick word on um, non-payment insurances through AFIC and Balthazar. AFIC and Balthazar are effectively a, a, a private market solution following the retrenchment of ECAs. Um, but towards the middle of the last decade, we've seen less ECAs activity for a number of reasons. The popular one on, on the US side was the deauthorization of US Exim under the Trump regime which meant it, 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 it was much less active in terms of support and aircraft financing. One solution around the, the absence of VCAs and, and, and more difficult capital um, availability was the, the, the non-payment insurance policy. Um, so Marsh, I think, you know, set up a consortium of insurers um, working with Boeing and Ford AFIC. Um, and the idea is similar to ECAs, you put in place an insurance policy which will um, cover you as a lender if your borrower defaults under its loan. Um, there are, it, it's unlike an ECA because it's not a state, AFIC is not a state body. Um, it's, it, there's, there's, there's less comfort in terms of it being sovereign risk or payout under the guarantee or the insurance policy. So there are more concerns around the rating and the credit worthiness of the insurance company in question and the insurers tend to have several liability which means you recover each portion from each insurer individually rather than jointly um, and of course there are different regulatory and, and tax considerations for insurance policies versus guarantees but the, the big advantage of AFIC and, and, and Balthazar, ba Balthazar is the European equivalent for trending for Airbus um, aircraft and the, the, the big positives of, of, of AFIC and Balthazar are they, um, it, it's more, um, I would say it's, it's less constrained by typical government support mechanisms like ECA, so it's not subject to OECD regulations or the, the aircraft sectorial understanding, 2011, um, because it has that added flexibility and it's, it's not directed at necessarily, you know, public interest perspective of support and exports, it has more flexibility and you don't need to be a specialized aircraft lender. lender um, to get involved in the space because lenders, some lenders, particularly in the market, are more comfortable with kind of the insurance analysis. Um, and typically, the, the insurers then would have standard intercreditor arrangements as to you know how the risk is allocated between them and the structure. That's that's me having talked for quite a while now. So I think Marie, I'm I'm happy to hand back hand back to you to take it home. Thank you, Keith. Uh, that, that was absolutely great. Uh, thank you. I give myself very poor marks for my slide management, but uh, thanks for your patience on that. Um, but um, that, that, that was great. Um, so, so back over to me um, in terms of just having a little chat around uh, a couple more um, uh, options that you will see at times um, so that we were trying to be as, as comprehensive as, as possible. Um, so one one aspect will be Islamic financing, and normally that's seen in terms of the Murabaha, which we put up this structure here, or the Sukuk bond. Um, so under Sharia law, it's not permitted to charge interest. So there needs to be a little uh, different uh, considerations with regard to how that the financing might work. Um, and, and aircraft financing does work uh, for Murabaha and, and Sukuk financings, and we've been delighted to have been involved in these, in these type of financings as well. Uh, so the, the Marabah is, is a kind of a cost plus uh, aspect uh, whereby the, the, the lender will, will take, uh, you know, the, the purchase and the risk of the aircraft and therefore uh, it's permitted to have a margin on that. And then the Sukuk 
uh, is issuance of, of a bond um, related to the financing of the aircraft as well. So, you know, other the structure itself is a little bit different than what you'll have seen um, in terms of what Keith had spoken to. Um, and it is important to understand um, and, and dig into what, how, what needs to be structured, where are the guidelines around this, what cannot, uh, what cannot be put into it. But um, it is a popular um, form of financing and certainly has been essential where uh, the, the financing has needed to comply with trial law, Sharia law. So, um, so just to bear in mind that that's, that is uh, available um, for, for, uh, the, for the industry as well when, when Islamic financing is, is required. Um, and then uh, I want to touch briefly on uh, WTC financing. So um, probably the easiest way to um, compare this is to say this is the kind of airline equivalent of the ABS capital markets uh, structures. So it's usually coming from one airline. It's using uh, capital market private placement elements. Uh, it, it, um, it allows and has, has been you know, a very popular um, mechanism for financing, particularly for US airlines, but also now uh, in, in many years, for the last number of years, has been used by non-US airlines. It's a very efficient form of financing and one uh, which um, ha has certainly been relied on and uh, importantly has been proven to be quite resilient in terms of uh, where airlines have to go through uh, restructuring uh, processes because you know, history would tell us that it is much more likely that an airline is likely to be subject to, you know, insolvency or restructuring um, uh, proceedings rather than the lessors. So those financings uh, do need to be robust in order to be attractive to investors going forward. And I think there is uh, stats in terms of how many uh, airlines have had WTCs and have gone through uh, restructurings and um, the, the structure has has held up. Um, so I, I don't plan to go into it um, in, in depthly, but wanted to just cover it and explain that that's the kind of capital markets uh, structuring and, and how uh, the airlines go about it um, for, for portfolios of their uh, financings and particularly when they're trying to uh, come up with a structure to finance their upcoming deliveries. So, so it is another option in terms of, uh, you know, in addition to uh, the, the secured uh, loan financings or the sale and lease backs, et cetera, that, that people may, may look at. Um, um, I, I just, I thought I might just stop there to, to note that um, we've seen, as we said, that there's, there is diversity in terms of the choices around um, what financings people may look to, but, but also it's important to remember that, and Keith touched on this as well, is that there has been over the years trends for want of a better word, better word in terms of what financing structures are popular. When, uh, uh, when bank loans after financial crisis, bank financing wasn't necessarily available. And um, then you saw the ECA step up to make sure that those aircraft that were rolling off uh, Airbus and Boeing ended up being able to be delivered and that the world's supply of aircraft um, could continue. Uh, when ECAs were not able to, to deliver, or at least certain of the ECAs, I don't want to, um, we're talking in general terms, but don't want to, to be too general. When certain of the ECAs couldn't deliver, what you saw was you had the, the APIC uh, Baltasar types of structures that, that stepped in and said, uh, when, when um, banks uh, found it uh, difficult because of, of interest rates and, and other cost of capital issues and regulatory issues, uh, we saw alternative lenders uh, step into that space. Um, so the, the industry is, is, um, is really uh, robust and resilient um, and it has the ability to innovate and see what's needed. I mean, what we're looking at now looking going forward in, in terms of predicting that we will have uh, quite a busy activity with regard to portfolio financings will be to, to see how we look at the existing structures, be it the ABS structures, warehouse, see is there tweaks or other elements that need to be examined to make sure that these are as robust as possible? What have we learned in terms of um, the various crises that um, the, the industry has had to, to cater for and has come out the other end of? So uh, there will be, it will be interesting to, 
to look at those structures and build those in because I don't think anybody will just be doing a rinse and repeat. I think people will stop and think, how does this need to respond now? What flexibility do I need? Um, how do I how do I build in discretion where where necessary? Um, is there is there security arrangements that that need to be enhanced? Um, but also we have uh, the new world uh, coming to us. Uh, so you know how will this financing um, need to uh, address the need for ESG and uh, sustainable financing going forward? What what will be needed uh, with regard uh, to that, and and what impact that will have with regard to the structures? So for us, it's very exciting to see uh, what will happen and, and what way it will it will uh, move. Uh, we will see maybe potentially an increase in terms of uh, regulated. Uh, investors who may need to invest through regulated uh, structures uh, using, say, ICABs or other regulated uh, structures, because that's an opportunity uh, for them to engage in the in the aircraft industry. I think um, I think it, I am safe enough to say that the industry is still incredibly um, attractive. Potentially, you you look at it as as counter cyclical in terms of maybe some of the some of the the negativity. Uh, that you, that you, that is coming out around other asset classes and around other areas in terms of what people are predicting for the next few years, whereas the uh, predictions around aircraft and and its its potential to deliver returns. Um, in, in speaking in round numbers, and I know um, you will get different um, different figures around this, but if we take it that there's twenty thousand aircraft to be delivered in the next ten years, and um, you know ten thousand. Uh, we go through uh, replacements and, and another 10,000 for increasing the fleet size. Uh, it, it does boil down to we need to have um, structures and an industry that is ready to address this in a way that that works and that people feel confident for whatever else uh, comes down the tracks that we can we can deal with it. So um, I, I'm hoping that, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether there's another few structures that we add on to this. Uh, that that develop over over the years with the ingenuity that that comes through the industry, particularly because the industry is attracting uh, new interest and new investors all the time, and they bring with it um, a wealth of experience from other industries and from other structures. And, and ask, can that apply to to aviation? So that's something that uh, we're really interested to be you know out ahead of, and I think uh, it it would be good to see how that how that plays out. And um, I'm just looking, I'm conscious of time. I did promise to, to stay on time. Uh, what I do want to say before um, I take questions, which we're very happy to do, is I, I, want, I don't want to forget to say a very big thank you to one of our very talented associates, Suzanne Cunningham, who put these slides together for us. So myself and Keith can't be taking credit uh, for the slides. So thank you, Suzanne. Um, and uh, myself and Keith are very excited uh, to be heading to, to San Diego and hopefully see See you all at the, the conference and you can interrogate us uh, further at that, but looking forward to that next week. Uh, Jan, I, I think I'm on time. Um, I don't know if there's questions that you want to, to throw my way. Or yeah. so, um, please, uh, the audience, please send in any questions that you might have through the Q&A button. Um, so Marie and Keith, now we have one question from the audience. Um, could you please explain the difference between recourse, non-recourse, and the limited recourse? Keith, I don't know if you want to jump in there and I can add anything else. Yeah, no problem. I think it, it, it's a point of particular relevance to the Irish companies and, and a point we're quite focused on when looking at the structures. Um, not recourse or full recourse is generally your borrower draws the loan and it's it's obliged to to repay repay the loan in or the, the borrower's assets rather and um, the debt can exceed the assets and one of the consequences of that on the irish side in particular is that a lender can um often petition to put a borrower into to an irish insolvency proceeding so it's it's full recourse outside of the assets limited recourse of some of those non-recourse is the lender's recourse is limited to the assets in question it's particularly important for our world because as marie said at the very start this is asset-based lending um it's it's not lending you know to, to, to public bodies where there's you know assurances that there's a sovereign stand behind them it, 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 there may often be credits done behind the lessors 
private equity funds or, or, or well-developed lessors that, 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 that have strong credits. But the theme or the principle in, in, in the industry is that the lenders lend to lessors as financing vehicles and their recourse is to the asset on enforcement. They take the asset, remarket it, sell it and recover the, the balance outstanding on their loan without, and, and the balance thereafter you know, depending on where the negotiations go on the deal may, may, may be extinguished so that the Irish part of the structure can be wind down or, or the SPV part of the structure can be wind down on a, on a, on a solvent and smooth basis. And, and I would just, I, I agree with you, Keith, and I, and I would just add in terms of the, the question being asked, um, it, is, it, it comes down to what I was mentioning earlier around um, say what what credit worthiness you're looking at like if you're looking at uh, this as an asset finance then you need to evaluate the ability of the asset itself to generate and and return uh, the debt that that's payable but you 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 can have a mix uh, sometimes so in some of the structures what you will have because of the structuring and where you're using spvs or we call it you have seen them referred to as spvs or aoes so these are the kind of special um, companies that are really just set up for this financing. They don't have much else uh, to provide. So uh, as Keith mentioned, in order to protect the whole structure and the solvency of the structure, they have to be limited recourse. So they can only pay back what they have received. And actually, in fact, that reflects the reality of it because they're not you know, organic businesses themselves. They will only have the revenue that they've received. So, so that aspect should not be controversial, but what where, where you can end up Having kind of a hybrid uh, limited recourse financing can be sometimes if there's a guarantee or somebody else that's stepping in behind and supporting that financing where it could be recourse to the guarantor. So um, just to be aware that uh, I think when you're talking about non-recourse, limited recourse financing, it is around that, that structured secured financing where people are looking uh, to the assets in order to repay Um and, and that's mainly what, what people mean when they when they refer to that. I, ho I hope that helps, but feel free to ask us uh, or drop us an email if, if you want to clarify anything. Thanks, Marie and Keith. Um, the next question is, can you briefly touch on the Jocko financing? Yes, uh, Jan, yep, no, no problem. Um, so this comes back to what I would have spoken to earlier in terms of the use of leasing um, as an ability to, to finance. and. Uh, JALCOs or JALs um, uh, were another feature of the Japanese market whereby uh, the, the investor can have an operating lease into, uh, into a company. And if the, the lease is considered to be an operating lease under Japanese uh, rules, uh, they can benefit from, uh, from efficiencies from a tax perspective in terms of depreciation, et cetera. Um, and the JAL, so just to, to break down the acronym, the JAL is Japanese operating lease. Um, and the COBIT is whereby what that has evolved to is having a call option in those uh, leases that doesn't disrupt it being an operating lease, but whereby there's incentives, and hopefully I'm using the right word, um, but essentially incentives to encourage uh, the airline and the, the lessee to, uh, to acquire title to the aircraft. Uh, without disrupting the tax benefits with regard to the, the leasing structure. So it's a it's very popular and 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 very much used and, and often we can see it uh, used um, in, in combination with other types of, of financing. So you know obviously uh, the Japanese investors are very familiar and very experienced in um, in understanding the, the aviation market and um, uh, really um, really have stayed active in that and, and hopefully will, will continue to be so that the JALCO I think is is here to stay in my mind and, and um, I hope that gives you some some sense of it. Yep, thanks Marie. Um, so the next one is if if someone wanted to acquire and control an ABS, do they have to buy the e-notes and the Series A senior notes? I'll uh, I'll start and Keith, you can correct me if I if I uh, forget anything. Um, but yes, in terms of looking at the ABS that are out there, um, what I will say is there's very much a common uh, structure, but uh, some will have uh, different nuances around how how they're they're structured, be it in terms of how the servicer 
uh, manages the portfolio and also how the e-notes um, are structured. And, and for those who were paying very close attention to Keith, so e-notes would be the, the bottom, the kind of equity notes and uh, the idea that they would be the, the last uh, to be paid off. Um, it, unfortunately, it's probably not the happiest answer to give you, but it does depend on digging into the structure with regard to uh, what options are there uh, with regard to acquiring the e-notes and what else uh, you would need to acquire. And, and I guess also what what level of control that you need around um, around the structure. So um, I think it, it, it's, it's not a, a straightforward one. And I think um, people certainly, as I said, will be looking at ABS structures because we do expect them and anticipate um, with, that they will be coming back um, as, as soon as, as, as people are comfortable with them. But I think it, hopefully it will be sooner rather than later. But people will look at those structures to see how, how they're set up. Sometimes the e-notes uh, were tradable. Sometimes they were held by the sponsor. And, and the flexibility around that uh, does kind of depend on the structure in place. Keith, I don't know if there's anything else you, you would add on that, but... It's not a, a yes or no answer, unfortunately. No, I I I'd agree, and, and no, not much to add. I think it, it really depends on on the structure in question and, and what you're trying to achieve in terms of getting control of the portfolio. You know, does it make sense to unwind the structure altogether and refinance with another product and, and, and transfer the assets out, or does it make sense to acquire the notes and the note interests and then exercise the relevant intercreditor controls between them? I think it's. It's very context uh, specific and depending on what you're trying to achieve partially. Um, and a related question to the ABS is, what is the reason that the ABS market has been shut down for the past year and is still expected to be shut down for at least the rest of this year? Um, obviously, the, the well, not obviously, but the uh, the, Coming out of COVID and, and the, the impact of the, the Russian-Ukraine war uh, meant that the capital markets shut down. The cost of capital uh, was, was just too high and it wasn't an attractive market uh, for people to engage in. You know, the, the capital markets are seen as a very deep market, a renewable market, and one that's incredibly important both to this asset class, obviously, uh, more broadly. And it became... It just became incredibly expensive and, and, and not efficient or attractive uh, for, for people to, um, to engage in. Um, that's, that said, on the second half of the question, um, I am really hoping that it will, it will come back sooner than, uh, I think the predictions are it will come back this year, I think sooner the better. Um, and I think there is a, a lot of pent up demand for this because as Keith said, many, um, Many issuers on the ABS are serial issues, issuers, and they would have entered last year expecting uh, to um, uh, to issue ABSs. So instead, had to had to flip and maybe put a, a warehouse or, or come up with other uh, financing solutions for their aircraft. But they would have been uh, solutions. Um, not saying for everyone, but but many with the hope that they would then be transitioned or that they would engage back in in the ABS market. So I think the view is that. Um, that the prognosis is good and that the idea being that we would see a return sooner rather than later, but I do think it will return this year. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to, to positive think that into, into place um, sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, so on a different topic, um, what do you see as the impact of the LIBOR transition on portfolio sales uh, and financing. Um, thank you. So this is the, the kind of interest rate uh, transition in terms of the, the LIBOR uh, change. And, and we've been working on a, a number of, of uh, deals relating to this. I guess, you know, at a very basic level, it's been a disruption for, for people in terms of agreeing the amendments uh, into those transactions. Um, but, but generally, and, and keep, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but generally it has gone uh, relatively smoothly and, and it, it, you know, the costs have tried to be contained uh, for, for the parties involved. But it is something that people are um, addressing and managing and being, you know, active around, uh, around creating the amendments that they need to, in their documents. So. Um, thanks, Marie. Um, that's all the questions we have from the audience. 
um, if anybody has one last minute question, please feel free to send in through the Q and A button. Um, so since we have talked about a lot of different financing structures and um, and uh, options, so for the benefit of our audience, is there any like resources that you would recommend the audience to, you know, study more if they want if they are interested in any particular structure or financing options? Well, actually, I, I think uh, the, the ISAT Learning Labs, because I know there was a preceding one on, on ABSs, there's a preceding ones on WETCs, if people want, uh, want to, to dig in um, in more detail in relation to, to any of, of those aspects, um, I, I think um, feel free to ask us if, if, there's, if there's questions. I know that we'll have issued various kind of insights and, and knowledge updates uh, around various different aspects and developments in the market. So if there's one that's that's relevant, uh, very happy to share it with uh, people. But um, I, I, thankfully, what I will say is compared to when I um, when I started off, um, you, you know, there is so much access to information and I think it's great. But I think people should should make sure that they're getting a variety of, of perspectives um, around it, because obviously everyone comes to uh, to the, uh, the the market with their own perspective. So I, I would say just make sure to to look around and, and understand uh, that there's a variety of perspectives on, for example, why one uh, in the context of this talk, why one structure is, is better than another. I mean, one aspect that we didn't touch on this structure because it's just a whole topic in itself and there is a, a learning lab on it is as part of the security and other other aspects that are put in um, to uh, to to create robust structures, the Cape Town Convention has been uh, really uh, pivotal to giving uh, lenders and investors um, a lot of comfort. And uh, there is a previous learning lab on this, but also there's a lot of information um, both on the International Registry website, but also AWG, if, if Cape Town is any, any aspect or, or topic that people will be interested in. Yeah, thank you very much, Marie. Um, the last question sent from the audience is asking if um, the audience can get a copy of the presentation slide. I think if you, you both are okay, it will be posted on the iStyle website um, tomorrow with the video, right? So, okay, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Marie and Keith for the very informative presentation. Um, and thanks to all the audience for joining us today. Um, so please know that this session is recorded and we'll publish it on the um, iStyle website tomorrow. Um, as well as I think on the YouTube channel. So um, we look forward to seeing you in our future iStyle Learning Labs. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for dialing in and uh, talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you all.